So, buenos días a todos. Me siento muy feliz y honrado estar con ustedes hoy para hablar de esta serie de encuentros sobre los objetivos de la educación judía en nuestro tiempo. Quiero felicitar y agradecer a Mauri por tomar la iniciativa a pensar la estructura de los, de los encuentros y su voluntad de crear, de crear un diálogo educativo entre los directores y los maestros y maestras de la educación judía en la red. Gracias, Mori, por tu iniciativa. Y es mi placer y mi honor es presentar al doctor Avram Infeld, uno de los educadores judíos más influentes y destacados en el mundo, fundador de la asociación Melit en Israel y su director a más de 20 años, presidente emérito de Hillel, escritor del libro A Patient for People, y creador de la teoría Las Cinco Patas de la Identidad Judía que va a nos presentar hoy. Ojalá un encuentro fructuoso y inspirador. Doctor Infeld, gracias por ser con nosotros, con nosotros hoy. Y cuántas palabras en hebreo. Eh, Doctor Infeld, nosotros vamos a ver que me tenemos la gdish mismancha, y la chloc mitzat me chokmatcha raba. עם הפורום המכובד הזה של מנהלי לימודי היהדות ברשת בתי הספר של הקהילה במקסיקו והמחנכים ויושבים גם איתנו חלק מחברי הפטרונט ומוועד החינוך ומסגל האוניברסיטה הבראיקה במקסיקו. אני ממש מאחל לכולנו ערב מעניין, פורה ומעורר מחשבה. שיהיה לנו ערב נעים לכולם. תודה רבה. תודה רבה לכם. Thank you very, very much for the invitation to spend some time with you. I'm very happy to be here. The uh, field of uh, education, Jewish education, the number of schools, the number of pupils who are studying in Jewish schools in Mexico is uh, renowned throughout the, uh, anybody in the field of Jewish education. And I'm honored that you asked me to spend some time with you. I'm going to talk, if I may, about three things tonight. Because I'm talking to people who are leaders in the field of Jewish education, I want my opening remarks to deal with leadership. I will then deal with the question of the mission of education, of Jewish education. And then I will try to talk about the content of Jewish education, and the distinction that I make between educating and teaching. So let me begin, please, with the issue of leadership. In just a few weeks, we will come to a major issue of leadership in Jewish history. The Jews are slaves in Egypt. God wants to take the Jews out of Egypt in order to do that. He needs to find a leader who is going to lead the Jews out of Egypt and bring them to Israel. And there's something very, very strange. Why doesn't God create one leader who can do the whole job by himself? Take the Jews out of Egypt and bring them into the land of Israel. I mean, how difficult would that be for God? We are told he created a world in, seven, in six days. So to create such a leader would probably take 15 seconds. But God does not create a single leader. I believe that the reason he doesn't do that is that God knows that if you want to lead Jews, you need a vat. You need a committee. You need a team. Leading Jews cannot by, be done by single individuals. And I want to talk for a moment about the team that God puts together to take the Jews out of Egypt and into Israel, because I think that there is much we can learn about leadership from that model. I would like to talk about the four leaders that make up the team that gets the job done. 
they are Moses, there's his brother Aaron, there is his successor Joshua, there is his sister Miriam. Those four leaders together manage to get the, the Jews out of Egypt and lead them into the land of Israel. I wanted to try to analyze what were the distinct qualities of these four Jews. You know, you were told in the introduction that I was the international head of Hillel. I spent a lot of my time hiring and firing people. I want you to know that if Moses would have applied for a job by me at Hillel, I would not have hired him. The only CV that I have for Moses is the Bible. And what do I find? I find a man who can't really speak very well. He's not articulate. He stutters. He's always arguing with people. He's very unpopular. Nobody likes him. The whole Torah is Moses said, and Moses said, and Moses said. When did he listen? He was a terrible administrator. He had to wait for his father-in-law to come and teach him about delegation of authority. He knew nothing about that. He had none of the none of the qualities that I hope in your University of Abraica you teach. And yet Moshe becomes Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest leader of all time. It's amazing. Any school of leadership does not use Moses as a model of leadership. He's always getting involved in other people's business. He sees a Jew and, a, and, and an Egyptian fighting, he gets involved. He sees two Jews fighting, he gets involved. Who asked him? And yet he becomes Moshe Rabbeinu. You know why? Because Moshe was driven by a mission. He knew exactly where he wanted the Jews to go. He didn't move from that by any form of persuasion. No bribery, not for the sake of popularity. Nothing moved Moses from his vision of where he is taking them. His brother Aaron was the exact opposite of Moses. He was known as a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace. Ohev shalom v'rodev shalom. He was always looking for compromise. When I try to imagine Aaron, I try to imagine somebody walking with his arm around his fellow Jew, saying, share with me, talk to me. He always listened. He was also very, very articulate. He could speak to Pharaoh and speak to the simplest Jew. And when Moses and Aaron worked together, everything went well. But one day, Moses gets a, gets a message from the chairman of the board, God. He says, Moses, come to a board meeting. It's going to take place on top of a mountain. It's going to be a long board meeting, 40 days and 40 nights. And Moses, climbs the mountain and leaves the Jews in the hands of, El, of the leader who has all the qualities of leadership except the vision. And Moses, who possesses the vision, climbs the mountain, leaves the children of Israel in the hands of a leader who has the qualities of leadership but not the vision. And what do they do? They build the Egel Azahav. They build a golden calf. 
That's the story of Jewish history. I think it's a story of all history. I think it's a story of all leadership. If you try to lead without a vision, you will end up building a golden calf. But as I said, when Moses and Aaron worked together, everything went well, but they were not enough to get the Jews out of Egypt and into Israel. You know why? Because they were both very cerebral. They both used their mouth. They both tried to talk. But if you want to lead Jews, you cannot concentrate only on the mind. You have to hit them in the heart. You've got to touch them in the stomach. You've got to move their legs. And that is why God adds to his team a woman by the name of Miriam. She is a Jewish woman and she doesn't talk. You know what she does? She sings and dances. She plays the tambourine. She gets people to move their feet. She brings passion to leadership. Moses brings a vision. Aaron brings an articulation of the vision. Miriam brings passion for the vision. Without those three qualities, leadership will not work. That's why all three were needed. But they were not enough to get the Jews out of Egypt. They were enough to get the Jews out of Egypt, but they were not enough to get the Jews into the land of Israel. And why not? Because none of them knew how to run the computer. None of them knew how to organize a business. None of them knew how to set up a Zoom call. None of them knew how to raise money. None of them knew how to divide the country between the tribes. And for that, God added to the stream the greatest administrator of Jewish history, Joshua, who leads the people into the battle for Israel. He divides the land among the people. He plays the, the tribes. He places taxes upon them. The four of them together get things done. Fulfill the role. That's my message to leadership. You don't have to be either a Moses, an Aaron, a Miriam, or a Joshua. But if you don't have a team that has all of those qualities together, then you are not able to fulfill the function. That is why leaders, you must have a vision, most important for why you're leading. Secondly, you must be able to articulate a mission. Thirdly, you must be able to have within your leaders people who have passion for the mission. I don't have to talk to South Americans about passion. You more than anybody else know what passion is all about. And then you have to have people on the team who know how to take the vision, the articulation and the mission and to turn it into a program of action. I would like, having said that as a message to the leadership, don't ever try to lead alone, Jewish leaders. Leave room for others to lead with you. And make sure that in the sum total of your leadership, you have all of those qualities. I want to talk, if I may, about vision. For me, the vision of Jewish education not the vision of Jewish scholarship, not the vision of Jewish learning, but the, Jew, the, 
the mission of Jewish education is how to ensure the continued significant renaissance of the Jewish people. That's the mission in a nutshell. The purpose, the vision, the mission for Jewish education is how to ensure the continued significant renaissance of the Jewish people. I chose those words carefully. Continued. It doesn't begin with you. It didn't begin with your grandparents. It didn't even begin with the Shoah. It goes way back. We have a long, long story. And we succeed in what, in what we do if we can pass on from generation to generation the desire to be a continuer of that long, long past. It has to be significant. It has to be put across in ways which are significant in the world in which the next generation lives. You must be able to talk their language. You can stay and continue to teach as if we were still living in the ghetto in Europe or in Syria or in Yemen. We are living in a modern world where the rapidity of change is unbelievable. And you have to continue to make sure that the methods you use, the language you speak, the way you touch those you're teaching is significant to them. And it has to bring about a renaissance. Being Jewish is to be being born again in each generation. It's not a copy of the last generation. It is being rooted in the past generation, but giving leaves and fruits of this generation. Vitally important, the continued significant renaissance of the Jewish people, not the Jewish religion, Judaism is not a religion. Judaism is the culture of the people. What's happened to us, and I recommend you read my book or books by Professor Eli Schreib, talks about what happened 300 years ago when the Jews met modernity that created a world in which we somehow, for some of us, we became a religion, for others, we became a nation, but we forgot about being an Am, Am Israel, the Jewish people. We have to ensure the continued significant renaissance of the Jewish people. They don't only live in Israel, they don't only live in America, they live throughout the world and they're part of the same people. And that has to be a part of what the Jews of Mexico pass on to their, those who are being educated. A sense of belonging to this thing called the Jewish people. A sense of belonging. What does it mean to belong? To belong to something means that it is of value to you, you get something out of it, but it also means you have a responsibility for ensuring it. We have to create that sense of belonging. My friends, it is not very easy. 
a few moments before my late father died. He was lying in hospital here in Israel. And he was a great Jewish educator. He was my most important leader in my life. I once said to my father, then right before he died, Abba, is there a minimum that a Jew has to know in order to be a Jew? Is there a minimum? I thought he would tell me there are certain parts of history they must know about. Maybe even there were certain prayers. Maybe there were even certain stories. My father said to me, this is five minutes before he died. It's been a message for me forever. Of course, there is a minimum that a Jew has to know in order to be a Jew. He has to know more today than he knew yesterday. That's the minimum required of a Jew. That is why Jewish education, my friends, is not limited to schools and it's not limited to children. If we allow our minds, the moment we think of education, to think of children, we will make Jewish education childish. If you recognize that Jewish education is something that the whole community has to go through, it's not much. It's knowing each day a little more than they knew yesterday. Young people have to be able to see adults learning as well. They have to be able to see their parents growing as well. If they are, come away with a feeling that they can go to a Jewish school and they can graduate from Jewish education, it's not an education. There is only one way to graduate from Jewish education. And that's to drop dead. As long as you're alive, you cannot graduate from Jewish education. So for me, the first step of the content of Jewish education, what do we do? What do we do? in order to create the sense of belonging. What do we do in order to help the people we're educating, adults or children, in school or outside of school? What are we doing to help them link their own very important personal memories to the collective memory of the Jewish people. Because you know what, a, what an am is? An am, a people, is actually, I want to tell you a story. I think I may have told it in that tape that you were sent about the bank in New York that had an advertisement which said, you have a friend at the Chase Manhattan Bank, the most popular bank in New York, everywhere they advertised. You have a friend at, the, at Chase Manhattan. When Bank Discount opened up its first branch, they looked for an advertisement to attract Jewish customers. And for a whole year, they advertised an amazing advertisement which said, you may have a friend at Chase Manhattan, but we're a mishpacha. We're a family. Irrespective of where we decide to live. In Mexico City, in Havana, Cuba, in Johannesburg, South Africa, in Jerusalem, Israel, or in New York or Moscow. 
We are one family. We're a very, very special kind of family. We have a special chromosome. A chromosome that I call the M chromosome. In that same piece that I hope you watched, which I said, I told the story of my father who hoped very strongly that I was become a physicist. And when I went to study at the Hebrew University, I went to study physics. But on the first day of school, I was sitting in the physics lab and I saw a beautiful young lady walking to the history department. So I graduated in history instead of in physics. She's now the great grandmother of my great grandchildren. But I had to let my father know that I was not going to study physics. So I turned to my father and I said to my father, Abba, I've decided not to study physics. I am going to devote my life to the study of Jewish history. And I got a telex from my father because we didn't have emails. And in that telex, my father wrote, I could see from the size of the letter that he was angry, but he wasn't angry at me. He was angry at the Hebrew University. He said, what? You are teaching Jewish history at the Hebrew University? There is no such thing as Jewish history. Jews don't have history. Jews have memory. Memory. And that is why the verb that appears more in our culture than any other verb is the verb liskor, zachor, zecher, zikaron. Remember, remember, remember. What's the difference between history and memory? History is knowing what happened in the past. Memory is knowing who you are because of what happened in the past. And that is why the role of the Jewish educator is to take the young student with the best talents and with the best equipments you have to take young Jews on a stroll down memory lane. Because when you walk down memory lane, you find everything that's important to the Jewish people. In memory lane, you will find values. In memory, Jewish memory lane, you will find God. In memory, lane, in memory lane, you will find the land of Israel. Down memory lane, you will find the Hebrew language. But they come together not as items that I just teach and impart, but that create that sense of belonging. I developed a theory, which many of you, some of you refer to, of the five legs of being Jewish. You know the Jews come from different places, have been through different experiences, we are never all going to be the same. I'm not going to become a Haredi. I'm a modern human being. I'm madly in love with my iPad. I cheat on my iPad only with my iPhone. I'm living in a modern world. And with a particular memory of growing up in South Africa where I felt like a tribe. And I meet American Jews who think that Judaism is a religion, whether they are orthodox or reform or conservative, they're convinced it's a religion. I find Jews in Israel who think it's a nation. We are not going to be uniform. But if we go back to understanding that we're one um, we can become 
unified without being uniform. It's not easy. It demands having recognition. It's vitally important. I don't know how much time I have left, but I want to end with one lesson about being Jewish that is very important to me. Every Friday night, Jews at the dinner table, at the Shabbat table, say the Shabbat Kiddush. My father, who was one of the founders of Hashomer Atzair, always on Friday night made the Kiddush at home. And I used to say, Abba, you don't believe. You're not a religious person. Why are you making the Kiddush? He said, because I find in the Kiddush on Friday night, and we repeat it every week, every Friday night, I find two very important messages that are central to being Jewish. In the first part of the Kiddush, we remember that God made this world. I love that idea where we are taught that there is a God. You know what's important about saying there is a God? You're saying to human beings, you are not God. Wow. There is nothing more dangerous in this world than a world in which human beings think they're God. When you say that there is a God, you are recognizing that I am not God. And by the way, Mauricio, nor are you. None of you are God. We are only human. And by the way, we are first and foremost humans. We are part of the human world. We don't have to be considered only of ourselves. We have to recognize that we have a human responsibility. And then right after we say the blessing over the wine, we talk about the exodus from Egypt. We are human beings, but we have our own narrative. We have our own distinct memory. I want to hope and pray that the Jewish leaders of the Jewish world including in Mexico City, will find the way to create among the people who are studying and learning in those communities a sense of belonging to the Jewish people and an understanding of their own particular narrative, but never forgetting their responsibility to the world as a whole. I thank you all for listening to me and Maurizio, I'll be, a, be willing to take any questions that anyone may have. Thank you very much for listening to me. I personally blame, blame it on the fact that we have stopped teaching about a Jewish people. We've taught about a Jewish religion. We have taught about a Jewish nation in Israel. We are not a nation. We are not a religion. We are a people, but we've forgotten to teach that. If we don't begin to educate everyone to that, the Haredi schools and the secular schools, to the concept of Am Yisrael, one Am, we will never be able to continue to be unified. It's not easy because it also demands recognizing that we are all very different. I'm, I, I am a Jewish pluralist. Some of my best friends are reform rabbis. I'm an orthodox practicing Jew. But for me, what is the centrality of pluralism? Or what is the difference between pluralism and assimilation? 
pluralism is living a different interpretation of the same memories. Assimilation is living somebody else's memory. We have to recognize that there is value in allowing people to give and to allow them to have their interpretation of our common memory. But for that, we have to teach our memory in an inspiring manner. Yes, it's my, that is why when I talk about the five legs, I say, Jews, choose three. You can't choose all five. My father was the greatest Jew that I knew, my teacher. He didn't accept religion. And understanding that some Jews have a relationship with God, that the Jewish people, you know what's amazing? The Jewish people have a love, had, you know, when I turned 70 and some of my friends came to greet me, I told them, you have to greet my wife as well because she's a part of my life. I can, the Jewish people are having a love, having a love affair with God for 5,000 years. If you want to talk about the Jewish people, you can't ignore that love affair. Whether God exists or not is irrelevant. He's played an important role. The concept of God has played a very important role in the mindset of the Jew. If we taught memory and family and Mount Sinai and the land and the state of Israel and the Hebrew language, and people chose three out of those for their own personal lives, we will be unified without being uniform. If you choose only two, there's a danger you may not have anything in common with other Jews. But if you choose three, you will always have something in common with other Jews. Gemara, in my second Kiddushin, I think it's Daf Lamed, if I don't remember, I think, it says, Hulil Mod, Uvno lil mod, hu kodem livno. If a person has enough money themselves, they should spend the money on educating themselves first. Because if adults don't relate to learning seriously, if it isn't seen by children as being as important as any other subject taught in any other university. Why should they relate to it? If you're teaching it only to children, then it's meant for children. And when you have a bar mitzvah, you graduate out of being Jewish. Why should it be important? Maths is more important. There's a big difference between teaching Jewish, Jew, uh, be, uh, Jewish education and teaching maths. I've never met a teacher of maths who wanted his pupils to become a triangle. They concentrate on teaching. When you're involved in Jewish education, you want the person you're teaching, the people you're teaching to be Precisely what Danielle spoke about, reflective, serious, aware, conscious. Those who take it seriously can tell you how wonderful that is. And that is why you have to model adult education as something that, sure, that young people can see. Otherwise, Danielle, we are sending the message clearly. Jewish education is for kids. I don't want to be a child. And I don't know any child who wants to be a child. It's not, it can't be important. 
if it not aimed at the entire Jewish people. So Daniel, I think it means accepting that fact we are an Am, and that Judaism is the culture of this Am, and a very important culture that impacts on how one lives their life, how one relates to others, how one deals. I mean, when I study Gemara, I find questions over there which are serious economic questions. When you build a society, what's more important to invest in the aged or in the children? What's more important? That's a serious question that anybody in the field of national economics has to deal with. Where are human priorities? Jewish thought thinks about all of those issues. We don't ever reach that. We keep teaching. I, I know of my friends' children in schools who for the 11th year are learning the same thing in school that they learned last year. What's the point in that? All psychologists will tell you that people develop what you teach as you develop with them and has to build on their abilities, the ability to think reflectively. But if they think reflectively about Jewish education the way it is in most of the world, they will reject it because it's meant only for children. Of course, it has to include children. People always ask me, at what age do we begin Jewish education? At five or at seven? You begin Jewish education at the age of eight days. Not at five or at seven. You impact a kid's education by the way the parents behave. My parents went to a Jew, my great grandfather went to a Jewish school, but he didn't go to a Jewish school in order to learn about being Jewish. He went to a Jewish school in order to get the knowledge that was inspired by the education he got in the home. We don't have that today. We have to rebuild that as an arm. Daniel, I don't know if I've answered your question, but my late father said to me once, if someone asks you a question, say what you want. If it doesn't answer his question, it's a sign that he asked the wrong question. That's all. <laughs> okay, thank you. First of all, we have... I, I mean, I don't know who I'm going to be insulting in the audience. But I don't understand this business of conversion to Judaism. Hebrew is giyur. Giyur has got nothing to do with conversion. Conversion, the word is hamara. You don't relate to somebody who becomes Jewish as having gone through a conversion. He has gone through the word giyur, which comes from the root of lagur, and to share the faith. I think that we should stop talking about converted Jews and talk about adopted Jews, people whom we've adopted in the, into the family. Look at, in life, adopted kids who are adopted into the family. If they're adopted with love, with warmth, with embrace, they absorb the collective memory. It is most decidedly possible to bring with you all kinds of other memories and find a way of linking to the collective memory of this people. It's much more than a religion. By the way, we are decidedly not a religion. Alfred North Whitehead, one of the most, describes religion in the following way. Religion is that which a man does in his moments of aloneness. It's that deep inner relationship between the single human being individual and God Almighty. Judaism doesn't talk 
about the relationship between the single human being, individual, and God Almighty. It talks about a relationship between a people and God. You know, the holiest day of the year is Yom Kippur. I go to the synagogue on Yom Kippur. I go every other day as well. But I go on Yom Kippur. And there's a prayer that we say five times. It's called the al -Khet. We stand before God, we ask him to forgive us, and we beat our chest while we ask for forgiveness for the sins. And we read out a long list of sins that we did. I'm a passionate person, as you can see. I beat my chest very hard. I can't touch myself for two weeks afterwards. But I want to tell you, and this is the truth, at least half those things on that list, I've never done. Daniel, believe me, half the things at least on that list, I've never done. So why do I beat my chest? Because we never pray in the singular. We only play in the fruit, pray in the, in the, in the plural. Al chet shechatanu. Forgive me for our sins. Which is why you need a minyan when you pray. We're a collective relationship with God and not an individual relationship with God. Culture is that element of life which includes those elements that are important to your membership in this people. For some, it may include a relationship with God. For others, it may not. By the way, there is a term converted Jew in Judaism. You know who's a converted Jew? Somebody who converts out, not somebody who joins us. Somebody who joins us is a Jew. You are not allowed to remind again that they're again. Once they've joined us, they are part of the family. Who's a converted Jew? Somebody who leaves us. But he doesn't become just a Mumar. He becomes a Yehudi Mumar. He's a Yehudi Mumar. Because that's the way it is in a family. How do you join a family? You're either born into it or you're adopted by it. How do you leave a family? You don't. That's what it's all about. Thank you. Jewish education has to be made important. Important. Therefore, pay the conveyors what they deserve to earn in, in Jewish education. You attract the best people to Jewish education, but you only do that on two conditions, that they are the best people you can find and that they are continuing to learn themselves. When we have teachers in our schools who themselves don't learn, why should a serious educator want to join them? If we have teaching things by rote and not with the depth that being Jewish can be, why would we attract Jewish pe people to Jewish education? I know that two of the people that I know in the audience, including Danielle and Maurizio, are very serious people. They've come to Jewish education because they value its importance. We've got to make it a valued profession. I want to thank you for inviting me to be the first speaker on the series. I know who the next uh, three or four speakers are. They are all distinguished educators. And uh, it's amazing that a community like Mexico is devoting this time to meeting with these people. Congratulations and all the best to all of you, and a happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah.